as Ken Michaels likes to say, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to Things We Said Today, uh, a Beatle podcast video cast where we talk about anything and everything having to do with the Beatles uh, together, solo, separate, wings, Plastic Ono Band. Uh, we'll touch on all of it here on Things We Said Today. Now, we've been away. There's a bit of a long gap. I don't actually know how many weeks it worked out to be, maybe three weeks or so, uh, while Ken was sunning himself in Hawaii. Uh, but we're back now with you here, and uh, I want to introduce you to uh, my 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 partners in crime here, Ken Michaels, Mr. Hawaii. Uh, you know Ken for his decades uh, of doing Beatle programming on the radio. Uh, these days he hosts Every Little Thing, which is a syndicated radio show. Um, and you can find out more about every little thing on kenmichaels.com. Ken also has a YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is almost like having another radio show. Uh, lots of interviews, lots of special guests. So check that out on YouTube. And also Ken co-hosts another podcast, Talk More Talk, which deals with Paul McCartney solo and with wings. Uh, and that, uh, am I leaving something out? I'm always leaving something it's all, out. It's all the solo Beatles. It's, it's all the solo Beatles, right. Well, I just changed it now. They didn't tell you? It is <laughs> no. now well, just McCartney. Okay. No. It's all the solo Beatles. So, uh, and Ken Michaels, uh, KenMichaels.com to find out everything he's up to. Ken, how are you? Did you have a great vacation? Yes, I did. Maybe uh, one day soon I'll break out the ukulele here. All right, Ken. Uh, great to have you back from uh, vacation. Alan Cozen, you know Alan, you've read Alan's work for decades, writing for the New York Times uh, in recent years, also for not only the Times, but the Wall Street Journal uh, and other publications as well. Uh, Alan has uh, a number of books under his belt, a bunch of Beatle books that he's written. But these days, all the attention is on his brilliant book that he's written with Adrian Sinclair called The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1. 1969 to 1973 and he's been working on that as his main gig these days he's been writing as long as we've been talking uh alan cozen great to have you back nice to see you after so many weeks good to see you darren good to see you ken and now we know we ken was on vacation and your kitty cats alan had and i'm hoping it was just a checkup but right in the middle of the whole vacation thing Alan's cats had to go to the vet and thought, uh oh. Yeah. But um, it was just checkups. Everyone it, fine? It, it was initially just checkups. And then one of them had some questionable reading. So he had to go back, but he turns out to be okay too. Terrific. Terrific. Soon we'll be talking about my new cat because we're in the process of uh, getting a new DeVivo kitten. So, Great. Uh, but this is going to be a really special show that we have for you today. Uh, as part of what we had planned all along, in doing a Ringo Store birthday show. Uh, Ringo just turned 83, and uh, we had all along said, you know, after when Ken's back, after the Ringo's birthday, we'll dedicate a show to Ringo Starr, and then a very special guest uh, became available, and Mark Rivera is going to be with us in a little while, uh, and we're going to talk about Ringo. Uh, happy birthday, Ringo. But first, it's time for the news and that's Ken Michaels' area. Take it away, Ken. You're now getting me in the mood to get a new pet between the two of you. <laughs> Maybe that'll happen. Maybe we'll all be on camera with our pets soon. We should do a pet show, yes. I pet sounds. Pet sounds. Or we'll be living in a pet shop. Oh, boy. <laughs> Speaking of Ringo, as Darren just said, he celebrated his 83rd birthday last Friday, as he has been doing every year since 2008 to hold his peace and love event in which he asked people all over the world at 12 noon their time to say think or post the words peace and love to create a wave of that sentiment encircling the planet he was in los angeles at the outdoor event which included some members of the all-stars past and present and other friends including greg bissonette joe walsh edgar winter sheila e Richard Marks, Jim Keltner, Ben Montench, Mike Campbell, Ed Begley Jr., uh, Diane Warren, Roy Orbison Jr., and others. 
And NASA continues to be involved in this event as they sent a pre-recorded message from Ringo into the universe at noontime from their Barstow, California base station into the Deep Space Network. Musicians paid tribute to Ringo songs at the show, including the group Silver Sun Pickups, who performed acoustic versions of It Don't Come Easy and Back Up Boogaloo, King Tough, and the guitarist Blake Mills. And for one song, Jim Keltner performed on Don't Pass Me By, Photograph, and there was an instrumental version of Good Night. Greg Bissonette jammed on Birthday. 28 countries around the world were involved in Ringo's big event, the Peace and Love event. Paul McCartney sent out the message on social media, happy birthday to two of my heroes. It's Ringo and my dad's birthday. So let's have a great day to celebrate these two great people, Paul. For a variety, Ringo Starr talked about the new Beatles song coming out. He said, it's not down to AI. It's not like we're pretending anything. That is actually John's voice, Paul's voice and bass playing, George on rhythm guitar and me on drums. And the two things that are new are Paul's bass and me on drums. I really worked at it just months ago here and it works. It's a beautiful song, you know, for all the madness going on around it. It's still a beautiful track and our last track. He was asked, why revive it now? Ringo said, I don't know. Paul must have had a slow day. He said to uh, Ringo, you know that track we did? Do you want to work on that? And Starr did. So McCartney sent him the files. Ringo says, I drummed on it and I sang on it. And then Giles Martin flew to L.A. with McCartney to put strings on it. So Giles Martin is involved. Ringo says, it is moving because the four of us are there and there won't be ever again. End of quote. Ringo also gave an interview to People magazine where he remembered when the Beatles did a tour with Helen Shapiro. He asked a member of her band how old he was, and he said, 40. And Ringo said, and you're still doing it? Well, Ringo said, little did I know, it's far out, but that's always stuck with me. Nothing makes me feel old. In my head, I'm 27. Wisdom's a heavy word. Getting older is what happens, and you try and keep yourself busy. Ringo also spoke with Vulture's Devon Ivy and said his career defining record would be Love Me Do because it was the first record. He said, we were on vinyl. We made a record. Even though when I got to the studio, George Martin had a session guy for the drums, Andy White, but I played on it anyway. He played it. I played it. He's on the album, I think, and I'm on the single. So go figure. He still hasn't figured this out. <laughs> anyway. He says, we were just blessed that George Martin took a chance on us because many record labels sent us down. But the fun was the fact that we were still touring and only the BBC was playing the song. It would say, oh, at 3.14 p.m., this song will be on the BBC. So we'd all pull over and think, wow, we're on the radio. I mean, it was a really big moment. It was magic because we were on this piece of vinyl all to ourselves. A lot of the tracks we did after that I loved, of course, the Love Me Do arrangement just came out of our heads. We didn't read music. We were buskers. There's nothing quite like the first. George Martin apologized every time I met him after we recorded that song. He would say, I'm sorry, Ringo, because he didn't know that we changed drummers. Ringo resumes touring with his current all-star band on September the 15th. And Ringo just recently revealed plans of releasing three EPs, which we all look forward to. Paul McCartney. Is I was it? just going to jump in one second. Did okay. you see something? I saw it in passing, very a uh, passing mention from someone that one of the EPs might be coming in September. I didn't see that, but that's... now it, it's you know you're two months away approximately, uh, and there's been no advance. Um, something I just saw uh, mentioned that one of the EPs is coming in September. So, well, that I mean, it would make sense, but uh, don't hold me to that because the tour resumes then. Mm -hmm. But he did say that he was finished with the first one anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after finishing this last tour, then he'd work on the second tour. Mm -hmm. The second EP. Second. Paul McCartney is in a new documentary called Squaring the Circle, The History of Hypnosis. Now, this was the team that did amazing artwork for album covers for Paul, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, Peter Gabriel, The Alan Parsons Project, Noel Gallagher, 
and 10CC. Best known for the front cover for Dark Side of the Moon, Paul McCartney and Wings, they did all the album covers from Ben on the Run through Back to the Egg, and after that, for Tug of War. A lot of work there, okay? In a new interview, Paul McCartney, jokingly, blamed Bruce Springsteen for concerts being so long these days. Since Bruce is known for putting on very long shows, Paul's concerts have gone on for three hours. Our friend Ken Womack wrote in Salon that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland is commemorating Ringo's 83rd birthday by having his Peace and Love statue on display there. And it will be there all summer long. The museum is continuing to run their Beatles film from Get Back to Let It Be, which runs through the end of the year. And they also have John Lennon's famous Epiphone Casino guitar that he played on the Apple rooftop. According to the Beatles newsletter, the very popular Cirque du Soleil show, The Beatles Love, which has been entertaining over 11 million fans for 17 years now, rumored to be ending later this year in Las Vegas, now we hear will be continuing through 2024 at the Mirage Hotel in partnership with the Hard Rock International. That's good news to hear. I was kind of hoping you were going to say is leaving Vegas and coming to New York City for a, a run. Well, maybe that's what's next in line. But I'm just happy that it's continuing because everybody should see it. Uh, with special thanks to Scott O'Rourke, who very often gives me some very valuable news here. He does a Beatles show on WUSB on Long Island, the University of Stony Brook, called With the Beatles. Um, he attended the brand new film, uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And in that movie, they're featuring the Beatles recording of Magical Mystery Tour. Not the whole song, but part of it. Okay, so it's becoming a little bit a little bit more common now to have Beatles recordings in movies. It would always be covers of Beatles songs. You wanted to I say read that, I read that it cost them a million dollars to use that section of Magical Mystery Tour, though. Really? Really? Wow. But I'm glad to see Harrison you. Ford said so in an interview. Uh, I can't remember where it was, but but he said it. Okay, that's what. And what what's the new one? Indiana Jones and the Chamber okay. Pot of uh, Secrets, is it? <laughs> the Dial of Destiny. I make jokes. Meanwhile, my family's all gone to see it, but I stayed behind to. I figure I'll stay home and watch a Met loss, a Met game. Is I didn't. Oh. But if you're a movie director, you now know what it costs to get a Beatles song in a movie. And that's not for the entire song, either. Maybe it's more if you put the whole song in there. It's just a single note at the beginning. And... Also, Scott gave me some more information. There's a new release coming out called Abbey Road Reimagined, a tribute to the Beatles, produced by our friend, Fernando Perdomo. The same guy that curated the Ram On tribute to Paul and Linda McCartney's Ram. All the songs from the Abbey Road uh, album are covered. Some of the recordings have already been released before. It's coming out August 18th on Cleopatra Records on CD. Also, we hear that Shanker Family and Friends, formerly on Dark Horse Records, well, it's being reissued tomorrow, July 14th. And, of course, it was produced by George. This was Ravi's 1974 album, now available again, and this time on Orchid Color Vinyl and CD, and remastered by Paul Hicks. Okay. Glenn Greenberg is back with a new book zine all on the making of the Beatles' White Album. Uh, every song and every story behind the songs are covered. Glenn has had book uh dedicated to both John Lennon and also one for Paul McCartney when he turned 80. And recently he had one all on Beatles trivia. So you can check your local supermarket for this or drugstore. Um, happy to say, since he's a big part of the Beatle family, Billy J. Kramer will be returning to London and Abbey Road Studios to record a new album this summer. And on his Facebook page, it says he will be celebrating his 80th birthday with friends, dignitaries, and other notable people in the UK. 
He's hoping to begin recording and assembling his latest music offering with a name and date to be determined soon. He says, I still have a lot of music in me and I want to get it out to those that have been my fans for all these years. We'll have more details on Billy when we hear them. Also, another big member of the Beatle family, Mark Hudson. A couple things about Mark. Mark, Earl Slick, and Chasm Sultan, known for his work mainly with Todd Rundgren and Utopia. They were in Hamburg, Germany for a Beatles festival which is called Come Together Experience. Apparently, this is happening every year now. This was on June the 30th and 31st. Hudson and uh, the other musicians, Earl Slick and Chasm Sultan, did a John Lennon tribute show while there. And also, Mark announced on his Facebook page, the Hudson Brothers. Oh, yeah. Coming back. Yeah. They are going to perform again after 40 years and he says quote we don't know where yet but if you can make it to the gig great if you can't we're going to stream it so let me know if you would stream it's going to be a blast stories that you've never heard great harmonies great songs and a chance for you all to see how poorly we have aged <laughs> anyway let me know if you will come or stream peace love and family from mark hudson so for those of you who were brought up on the hudson brothers from their tv show you bought any of their records and you followed Mark through his life as a producer for Aerosmith and Hanson and Ozzy Osbourne and lots of people. And of course, Ringo, something that uh, will be happening. Um, actually, I can tell you, because we just interviewed Mark Hudson on my other okay. podcast show, Talk More Talk, it should be happening in October. But as we hear more, I'll let you know more about that. A couple it's of passings. Amazing. What's that? Just the one show reunion? As far as I know, it's only one show. It sounds like it could be like a storyteller's kind of thing. Um, there are two major passings to note. The death of Mo Foster, who is a multi-instrumentalist and probably best known as a bass player. He played on eight of the ten songs on Ringo's Old Wave album. And he was one of four co-writers for In My Car with Ringo, Joe Walsh, and Kim Goody. He died from liver and bile duct cancer on July the 3rd at the age of 78. Those of you who are radio buffs, we have to note the passing of Dick Biondi. He was a legendary voice of Top 40 Radio in Chicago, who is believed to be, and very likely is, the first American DJ to play a Beatles record when he played Please Please Me on Chicago's WLS in February of 1963. The Chicago Sun-Times reported that at his peak at Top 40 Powerhouse WLS from 1960 to 1963, Biondi had a 60% share. That's unthinkable. 60% share of all listeners attracting millions of teens in 38 states and Canada. He had a 67-year career and was inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame in 1998. Dick Biondi died on June 26th at the age of 90. So I say it's very possible that he was the first person to play a Beatles record in the United States. A lot of it makes sense because Please Please Me was released on VJ Records. VJ Records was based out of Chicago. WLS is in Chicago. They had a relationship going there. I do recall seeing Please Please Me on their top 40 chart at the bottom of it. And we also know, also, um, Bruce Spizer has written about it. She Loves You got airplay in, uh, in Massachusetts, I think in the Boston area. So it wasn't just I Want to Hold Your Hand in Washington. So uh, sad to hear, but uh, what a legend right there. And top 40 radio dick biondi and that's all the news i have for you all our news well thank you so much ken and now on with the show and it's our very special birthday salute to ringo star just celebrated his 83rd birthday uh what are we talking here oh not even a week yeah, about a week ago now uh on july 7th and it gives me great pleasure to flip this magic things we said today switch and bring in our very special guest for the show, saxophonist Mark Rivera, you know, his work as uh, the music director in the all-star band and 
for even longer than that. We're talking about 40 years, more than 40 years playing in Billy Joel's band. And, well, why don't we just go to the conversation now? Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Rivera. One. And it's such a pleasure to welcome uh, our special guest to Things We Said Today, a musician um, that really doesn't need an introduction. You know who he is, but as we talk, you'll get the gist of everything having to do with the great saxophonist Mark Rivera. Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to spend a little time with us here on Things We Said Today. Darren, it's absolutely my pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for being patient because it has been a little bit crazy preparing for the uh, Hyde Park show and spending time with my bride for our anniversary. So thank you for being patient. And uh, you, between you and Ken, it's it's we go back a long time. So mm. it's my, my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mark recently published his memoirs uh, called Sideman in Pursuit of the Next Gig which Ken is modeling. Uh, Ringo provided the forward to the book, which has been yes. out now. Did it come out this year or did it come out last year? came out February 7th, which mm-hmm. is a very special date because that's a date that the Beatles landed at Idlewild before it was even uh, Kennedy. Right. right. So, in fact, what's really upsetting is that he read the audio. I got him to read the audio for my audio book, which I read as well. And... If I'm allowed to say it, the knuckleheads at the company were trying to force him to sign a full uh, disclaimer that they could use any part of it in any way they wanted to. And with AI, no joke, uh, they could do anything. And he refused to sign that uh, release. And I understand it. So my audio book is minus his beautiful, beautiful uh, introduction to me. Were you at the last, were, I, were, I, were either of you at the last Beatle Fest in yeah. New York? Yeah. Okay. When Ken Dashow introduced me, the first thing he said was, rather than me introduce, I want to let you hear what a friend of ours said. And Ringo spoke so beautifully. And it really upset me because he did write the, the uh, forward in the book. And it's like one of the greatest thrills to have him, uh, first of all, as a friend, but to have had, had written the forward. And then they wouldn't allow the forward, the, the, the verbal, the, the narration. And it just really ticked me off. So anyway, it's their loss. It's absolutely yeah, their exactly, loss. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, Mark, from working with Ringo and the All Star Band, and he continues to work with them, even though he doesn't go out on tour with them and hasn't for the last handful of blah, 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 how many tours. But he's been playing with Billy Joel since what? The early, early 80s. And 82. 82. This is my 41st year. Wow. <laughs> Daryl Hall, John Oates, and Foreigner, and on and on and on, ladies and gentlemen, Mark Rivera <laughs> at things we said today. So, uh, so what's been keeping you busy lately, Mark? <laughs> uh, you know, not nothing too much. Just uh, you know, doing some stuff for the book. I'm putting together a, a group of uh, a bunch of gigs that I'll be doing. Hopefully, uh, I'm not sure which venues we're going to try to to nail down, but like a northeastern or like I'll, I'll call it the Acela tour down the east coast. I'm going to put together a small band. We're going to play some songs and we're going to tell stories uh, and we're going to talk about the book and do Q and A's. So that's, I'm trying to pull all that together. And it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty daunting task because it's, you try to get this, the most important things together and you try to make it. So it's not like, I don't want to do it like one of those. And then I, and then I, and then I, because I try to avoid that in the book because what happens is it just gets to be like, oh, the great, 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 great. No, it's also, then I couldn't pay my mortgage. And then I had to, you know, leave my sons for lengths of time. So it's all about the highs and lows of what it means to be a sideman. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of like a narrative. I guess I'm putting together a, a, a storyboard or a one-man show. Right, right. Um, <laughs> and, and, and recently, Billy Joel announced that, you're reaching the end of the line of the gigs at yes. Madison Square Garden. So although it may not be impacting you at the moment, the fact that the buildup is now underway, that oh, adds, yeah. I guess, just a little more to uh, to everything that's going on in your world right now. Sure. Well, um, I'm getting a lot more calls about, hey, can you get tickets? Hey, can you get tickets? And it's <laughs> it's become the hotter ticket than it's been. I mean, it's always been a pretty hot ticket, but now it's like, yeah, everybody wants to come. Let me make a note of this. Don't 
ask Mark. <laughs> Note to self. Uh, <laughs> after interview, do not bring up. Um, why I'm, I'm curious about the timing now with Billy. Why did he decide what went behind his thinking of, all right, we've done enough. Let's bring it to a close. Uh, again, it's the close of the of the residencies. By no means a close to his wanting to play live. We're doing the March. I believe it's the March show will be the hundredth show in the residency, mm -hmm. and I believe July of next year, which is the projected uh, final show, will be his one hundred and fiftieth show at the Garden. I don't know who's going to do one hundred and fifty shows in this lifetime especially a hundred shows in that consecutive or that, that residency type of mindset. Mm -hmm. I don't think people, I don't think people care enough to, to be honest. I think we sold over 2 million seats or somewhere there about it, it's, it's a staggering endeavor that he's put together. And uh, it's like I said, we're just not going to play the garden. Right. Uh, God willing, I'm <laughs> not good. Uh, first of all, he's singing better than ever. In my opinion, his, uh, self, self, um, what's the word? self effacing It's just like he's so. He, he's just like yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he doesn't take a compliment. Even he's like that self deprecating. Thank you so much. That was a, that was a, 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 a <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's so he's totally self deprecating, and it's just a matter of like I think he wants to go out like a champion. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, I, what came to mind when I heard that we were going to end at 150 shows. Do you remember the shot of uh, Cassius Clay at the time standing over over uh, Sonny Liston? Yeah. Like that's that guy. And then the same guy go down when he gets his, uh, when Ken Norton, did he break his jaw? And as time went on, uh, but the long story, the, the point I'm trying to make is he kissed the canvas a couple of times but still came back and was a champion. I think Billy wants to go out with that. Not like he doesn't want to hobble out. I mean, you right. will not be able to get a ticket. It's going to be insane. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. already gotten insane, but, um, and I'm, I'm proud to be a part of this. I mean, I played, if he's, if when he ends up doing 150 shows, I will have done 142 of them with him. Cause I only missed eight shows before I, before I joined the band. Right. And what so do you think the number is for his career at the Garden? Then it's one hundred and fifty total cold career, or the residency is one hundred and fifty. No, the residency will be one hundred. Okay, so his total career will be one hundred and fifty. Uh, okay, and I would have played at one hundred and forty-two. Wow, which is still it's a lot of shows, you know. And I, and I, I over forty I, years, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the residency must be like a, a like a dozen years or so because I, I remember yeah. writing a piece about it when it was announced in the, in the Times, and I left there in two thousand fourteen. So right, right, a long <laughs> time ago. <laughs> I think it's I think it started in thirteen because my last gig with Ringo was thirteen, mm. and I had to. Uh, I remember Ringo had I think it was February of thirteen, and Ringo. I'd already booked a tour. I think we went to Japan or South America. I think it was South America now that I think of it. And uh, we had had the whole tour lined up. And I told Ringo, yeah, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on. And then Billy came up with two shows, I think, in one in Dublin, one in Manchester, England. And I told Billy, I said, Billy, I, I have a problem. I've already committed to Ringo. And it's like six weeks of work. I said, and it's Ringo. I said, so Billy goes, you know, Billy Joel, Ringo Starr, Billy Joel, a Beatle. He goes, you got to go with Ringo. And it was like, so it was so a fan <laughs> and a guy's guy saying, you got to go with Ringo. It's yeah. like, okay, I'll forgive you. So uh, the wonderful saxophone player, Andy Snitcher took my place for two or three gigs. But uh, that's when I think at that point, soon after that, we started, or they thought about the residency. I think they've been asking him about that for years. And he kept saying, no, nah, nah, I don't think so. I don't. And finally, he's like a franchise, is this and that. It's almost like, I'll make you an offer you can't refuse. And uh, I think it is, I think it's like, could it be 11 years in the 11th year, 10 or 11 years? Hmm. Does that sound right, Alan? 
Yeah, well, if it started in 13 sounds about right. So it would be um, 10 years years. and then 11 by the time he's finished. Right, right. And then two years went down with with COVID. Oh, yeah. So there is that. Yeah. No one no one wants to remember that. But uh, so Um, before my mind. Mark, before I throw it over to Ken and Alan, I have one more question. Something I don't think I was aware of uh, is that all these recent years and recent All Star Band tours, you're still rehearsing with the group. Absolutely. You know, I don't think I was aware of the fact that the tie was not cut with the All Star no. Band. And no. Tell me, tell me the process of what what do you do now? You've con- stayed on as the music director, but you then leave and let the the kids go out to play. Uh, well, I go out there and basically I, I call myself the court cop or if, the main thing I think I do is bring everyone in and remind them of what they're expected to do. The great Bill Belichick line, do your job, is to me the most important thing any band member can do. And the other thing is these guys, when they leave Ringo's band, they're all the star of their band. They're all the guy. And it all revolves, I won't say it's, like, it's not, a, not an ego thing, but it all does revolve around them. Uh, when when uh, Colin Hay goes out, it's Colin Hay. When Toto's oh. out, it's Luke. And and anyone who's out there, Edgar and all of them, are the stars. I go out there and remind them, we have to be a band. And that takes maybe two days. But the, the backstory on that is, which is uh, one of my favorite stories of all time, that we I had the same problem talk about uh, uh, an embarrassment of riches at one point billy had already thought about going out on a tour and ringo in that short period of time said i'm putting together a, a band he called he called me i got the email from bruce Grickal and i had to tell i told bruce because i was so terrified that i had to call ringo and tell him he says, Mark, you just go call him. Richie loves you. So I called Ringo. I said, hey, Richie, uh, how's everything going? Oh, all oh, good. How are you? I said, I'm, I'm well, but I have a problem about the tour. I, I don't know if I could make it. Are you all right? He was just concerned that I was okay. I said, yeah, well, unfortunately, or the, the way it's turning out is Billy's planning a tour, and it's this long tour that I can't say no to. That was probably 2013. Um, and he said, oh, that, that's a shame. And there's this pregnant pause. Hmm. And I'm thinking, okay, that's when you take my, my phone number and you put it in the cylindrical file. <laughs> but the moment broke and he said, but you'll still be my musical director, won't you? And I thought, there's a, there is a God because more than anything, and, and this is my heart speaking I love the accolades of being his musical director, but I love him so dearly as a friend. And I, I was more concerned that as it would have happened, that he would have decided, now, nah, Mark, I, I don't want anything to do with Mark anymore. He, he let me down. But he turned that whole thing around and he said, but you'll still be my musical director. And I was so blown away with his kindness and, uh, and the fact that I could still do it. I mean, I go, I go to these rehearsals and the first thing I do is I'm, you know, I'm standing there. Before he gets there, we'll run his songs and I'll sing his parts. And we'll, and, I, and one of the main things is I get the vocals together. Again, that's one of the mo- most important things because all these great bands have these wonderful harmonies. And this has been going on since, um, I mean, I was doing it back with, uh, at one point, I was already out of the band when Billy Squire was out with him and when Edgar first came out. and all these different uh, iterations of the band. So I have to know all this stuff. I mean, if, if, in, in the, the forward of the book, he said the first rehearsal, it was obvious that Mark knew all the chords and all the background and all the lyrics to all the songs. I did. I was ready to be Ringo's musical director when I was 17 because I had already played all these songs in these clubs, all my favorite bands. And I've mentioned to Ken uh, just before, the 97 All-Star Band was my favorite band of all time. I got to play with my heroes, with Jack Bruce, with uh, with with uh, Simon Kirk, with with Gary Brooke. It was just an amazing group of guys, and it was that time capsule of the '67, '68, '69 bands. Free. Uh, it was just amazing. So, like I said, I was ready to be his MD, but the fact that he said that, 
you'll still be my musical director. It, yeah. it just touches my heart to think that, uh, you know, I'll, you know, I'll call him or he'll call me. And we're just, you know, conversing just like two friends. It's the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So let's go uh, see what Ken has to uh, to say. Ken, got, I'm sure you, Ken's got a bunch of questions for you, Mark. Okay. Three pages, three pages worth. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to one third of one, maybe. <laughs> but, um, actually, I just want to bounce off what you were just talking about, Mark, because there's a great story in your book about the first time you joined the All-Stars, which was the third tour in 95. Right. And you're meeting all the musicians and you're saying in the very beginning of the tour... They didn't play that well. Well, it was it was obvious that no, they, they, it was obvious that they didn't do their homework. They thought they could just go in, listen to a CD, and it's just going to come together. It doesn't just come together. You have to pay tribute, or you have to be respectful to each song. I mean, that band, uh, Mark Farner, Felix Cavalieri, Randy Bachman, John Entwistle, wow. Billy Preston. I mean, come on. It was a trip, and then and, and, and what's his name? The drummer Ringo. We had yeah. so you had to be the first song we did. If I remember, it was "Don't Come Easy," hmm. and it's the da da da. It don't come easy. It was like whoa, whoa, whoa! Did you get the same CD I got? Because it was not happening, and uh, it was <laughs> my. It, it wasn't even my job at the time, because if I remember right, Felix was supposed to have been the musical director, right. And I think in his mind, it was going to be like, oh, just a bunch of guys. Uh, they're going to get the CDs and we'll just play the songs. It's not like that. No. Each each band that we were representing, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, after we finished the first couple of songs, we got to, we got to um, I'm Your Captain. And nobody broke out an acoustic guitar. So I had my big road case. I broke up my acoustic guitar. And am I in your cab? Am I in my cabin dreaming? Nobody wanted to touch that. Hmm. But I did. I didn't care what I had to lose. If, if, if I blew it, I blew it. Same thing with Rosanna. When we first did Rosanna with Toto, I just jumped on the on the uh, Bobby Kimmel part because I knew it. So that first meeting was... It was kind of like a bit of a shock because I expected everybody to come in there. I, I'd only had like maybe 10 days or two weeks to, to pull that together. And I was shedding the stuff. Again, I played it with so many different bands as a kid. Yeah. But now it was for real. It wasn't like it wasn't like uh, it wasn't uh, the Hunkamunka in Queens or one of those clubs that we, we play at or a club in Brooklyn somewhere. It was the real deal. So. Yeah, I took it upon myself to, to jump in there in, in the deep end. One of the, the great points you make about that time in the very beginning of that third tour is that while these are all great musicians, they were mainly used to playing just their own songs. They were not used to backing up people on, on their other songs, but you knew all Correct. that material. Yeah, I remember a great quote uh, when Greg Lake was in the band. I, uh, I kind of insisted because he wanted to play Obviously, Carnival Nine with Shirley E. and Howard Jones, which was spectacular. Mm -hmm. So Carnival Nine uh, and then uh, Lucky Man. So those two were like great, great big songs. And he goes, and I want to do From the Beginning. And I said, Greg, why don't you do Court of the Crimson King? He goes, well, why would I play that song? I said, well, because it was the beginning of prog rock. I said, trust me. He goes, trust you. Well, uh, I made it. His quote was, I made a career uh, 40 years of the same 20 songs. And he's wearing it like a badge of honor. I'm like, dude, there's something that happened before that. So I said, let's just run Court of the Crimson King for giggles. And the first show, after Ringo did his first three songs, we did Court of the Crimson King. And and when the part of the chorus comes, from the Court of the Crimson, oh, 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 the entire audience stood up and Greg looks over at me and we're like <laughs> you know so I, it was kind of, and, I, and I told you so a moment but these guys have made a career out of just what they knew and what they were safe with and 
we have to bring it. We have to. I always think the most important thing to me is that it's Ringo. And we're going to do other songs. And Ringo put his slant. I mean, he's going to swing everything. Ringo's got that swing that nobody has. Hmm. So everything gets in that Ringo pocket, which is a, it's like down in the length, as we say, the, the pocket. He's uh, he's just got it. So, but that's, it's been a, an absolute joy. You know, you just brought up the tour that is my favorite of all the Ringo tours. To have Howard Jones and Greg Lake and Roger Hodgson with Roger that. Hodgson, yes. Yeah. Oh and man. E. <laughs> and you know, to go from in the court of the Crimson King to the glamorous life. <laughs> I mean, the <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. were there yeah. any bands that really took quite a while to gel? I'd say um, were they all receptive to each other's music? Everyone's receptive, but whether or not everyone is really capable or the right fit i remember the, the one band that i thought was a disaster but we pulled it together was the one with um eric carmen oh. and uh trying to think who else was eric carmen my brain's not working right now. simon kirk eric carmen uh but for some reason i didn't see that as the Dave Edmonds, yeah. That's who we're in Jack. And, okay. Simon Kirk. Yeah. Well, Jack and Dave Edmonds did not get along. Hmm. Wow. It was, I don't know why. In fact, there was one time during the solo of either Sunshine of Your Love or uh, I think it was Sunshine of Your Love, Jack literally walked off the stage. And I'm like, it was so weird. It was just a very, and I was having to deal with Again, one of my heroes, because they'd already been through a great tour with him. Um, what do you do? What What do you tell someone when they're... It was just It was just not... It didn't feel right. It just didn't feel right. So that had to be the one that, that I thought was the hardest to pull together. But the, the people loved it. I mean, when all is said and done, you're hearing five acts in one. You're seeing five shows. Mm. And the concept and the whole thing it's just a it's a it's a brilliant night there are people who come every time they say that's the greatest show i've ever seen yeah. because i got to see my favorite people in in a in a group that you'd never get to see when would you see like i said the 97 tour or 95 97 or even and this tour when would you see this collection of these great talents together yeah. except on, on ringo's stage yeah and there's a lot of fans out there that go to the shows and they know they don't necessarily know the names. Right, so right. You're Colin Hay and you hear who can it be now? Right. Oh, 100%. Yeah, that's the oh guy. that guy. Yeah, that guy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, you're, you're you're absolutely right as far as that's concerned. Um quick question. I know in the very beginning, David Fishoff was the promoter for, for the tour. Yep. And it's my understanding he picked a lot of the acts, I would think, although first tour had a lot of Ringo's friends in there. Well, the first tour was, I mean, you had Keltner. Yeah. So come on. Jim Keltner, uh, Joe Walt. Uh, Billy Preston. Billy Bob. Preston. I mean, I mean, right the there, the you can stop right. I'm sorry? The guys from the band. Dank yeah, Dolph. yeah. LaVon yeah. Helm. Uh, 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 why can't I think of his name? Was Garth, Hutch Garth Hudson was there, too, wasn't it? John in that? Danko. No, I'm trying to think of the bass Rick player. Rick Danko. Tip Rick Danko. Rick yeah. Danko and the second was Timothy B. Schmidt, I think. But it was Rick Danko. Yeah. It was Rick Danko and Levon Helm. Levon Helm. Uh, I'm sorry, Rick Danko, Levon Helm, Jim Keltner, Billy Preston, Ringo, Joe Clarence Walsh, Clemens. Nils Lopkin, Clarence Clemens, yeah. Dr. John. Yeah, that was Come a monster. Yeah. It, uh, I think that one, I believe. Again, I wasn't privy to those those uh, those those rehearsals or the or the the show the gig. I think Ringo said, "Oh, I'm gonna, I like this guy and I love this guy." Because I mean, Jim Keltner and Ringo. I was talking to my dear friend Jimmy Braylauer. Uh, we're talking about Ringo's drumming, and he said Keltner and Ringo are the two most song oriented drummers ever. They yeah. played the song, and. The reason I love certain songs by Ringo is not because of some necessarily some technical prowess. It's just a matter of 
what he played in this two and a half to three minute beautiful piece of music. It's like perfect. They're perfect parts, and mm -hmm. his drumming is his finesse is spectacular. It's uh, there's no other word for it. But as far as the picking of the band, the band members uh, by the after the after the the ninety seven tour, I missed one tour because of the, another. Uh, I think Tim, uh, Timmy Capella took my place in in, in would that have been like eighty nine or so? So I missed that one tour and then it came back. But then I got to uh, I was asked my opinion, and at that point, after that point, I forget what year David left or was whatever happened with David and Ringo. Um, Dave Hart is now the guy. So Dave Hart is constantly sounding me about what do you think um and then you had you, you get guys who individually are fantastic and uh, i was in a band with a guy named john and paul and they didn't get along so it was you know john wait and paul carrick uh just wow. you know paul is so such an amazing musician and and i love john john's got one of the most amazing voices but he was so uncomfortable with certain grooves. I remember he was terrified when he had to play Sheila stuff. It was just, and I love him. I see him. And we, in fact, I saw him in Los Angeles a, a few months ago. And he gave me this thing. He goes, he goes you, were, you were the one friend I had. I needed you so badly. And it was so sweet. And, uh, but it's getting people to play together. Right. It's, it's not as easy as it sounds. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't just get up there and start strumming a G chord. It's, you got to get it. You got to get in the in the weeds with all this stuff. I was wondering if there were any acts that whose music Ringo really wasn't familiar with. Did he really know Sheila E's music? Did he really know? Oh, uh, he 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 admired Sheila. He he wasn't that um, uh, glamorous life. Uh, that was a tough one, but uh, uh. He was pretty much familiar with it. all the all the musicians. I can't. I gotta think if there's anyone that he was like. Oh, how am I gonna learn this? There were certain songs like Carnival Nine. Obviously, that's a trio. Um, <laughs> when we do Frankenstein, that's his moment to take a rest. Uh, certain songs are just really not. I won't say not in his wheelhouse because he could play anything, but it's almost like he lets the band shine. And he take. I mean, he's eighty three years old. Yeah, and he takes a moment. And he gets some gets a, uh, some carrot juice or whatever he does. Oh, uh, you know his, his thing is yes, that broccoli. <laughs> Eat broccoli every day, Mark. He says so. It's uh, a hey, God bless him. I mean, I don't even know how people do what they do. I mean, people come to mind. Eighty three. Tom Jones is eighty three. He's a week older than Ringo, a month older than Ringo, rather. Uh, Ian Hunter, who was spectacular in the tour. <laughs> I should tell you some stories about him. It was just a bunch of great people. And these guys, someone asked Ringo one time, uh, are you planning to retire anytime soon? What the hell would I do? And and Billy says the same thing. Stop playing. What, what would I do? Stay home and drive my wife crazy? You got to do what you're blessed to be able to do. Hmm. And that's kind of what we do. We're so much better for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that, Ken. Let's uh, let's go over to Alan. Uh, can you? Uh, we'll go, Alan. Uh, yeah, you, I'm. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the mechanics of the musical director um, job because you, you know, people don't think of rock bands as having a musical director most of the time. You know, um, whereas in in my other world in classical music, a music director is like imperative. Boss. Absolutely, yeah. it's imperative, right? Yeah. Um, so. Did you have to, um, you know, get get the lists of songs in advance that people were going to consider bringing to the show, and uh, and 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 work out your own charts and things for for all? There the were years? no. First of all, there were no charts. Were you <laughs> were you the only one there who could read? <laughs> Not necessarily, but there were no need for. There was, I'd, I'd actually have to say. Um, I was also in the position to pick and choose songs. As mm -hmm. I got to pick and choose some of the band members, I was also able to say, let's do this song. And, you know, Ringo's, Ringo's thing is got to be, I don't want to hear about a, a new song you wrote for your aunt. I want to hear the, the hits that people come to put the butts in the seat to see. They're paying money to see an all-star band. 
So the first thing is chart positions that they charted and that they received that they'd be received uh, by the audience. Then um, each band has different strengths. I won't say any weaknesses, but each band shows a stronger point. Let's say the vocals in one band were like just just mind boggling. And so you were able to tackle those differently than you would if it was like a little bit lesser. So my job was to, I guess, knowing the songs and the material to make sure that I made everyone aware. I, everyone had the uh, everyone had the the, uh, the list of songs and then I made a, a set list. So I let them know how it was going to follow. Um, it was it was kind of easy because who says no to Ringo? Right. And everybody wanted to be in the band. So my job was the hardest part of my job is, and I make everything analogous with with a with a, a sports with, with a sport. Uh, like I said before, uh, the, the famous uh, Belichick line: "Do your job." Sounds so easy. Do your job. But knowing your job, my most difficult part of being the musical director for these stars is as in a pick it, pick it, any team, basketball team, hockey team, football team, any one of these things you have, let's say I'll, I'll, I'll use basketball because it's five guys. Okay. Coach can go up to one of the stars and shake him or like punch him and say, you got to do this and really get in his face. And he'll get that. He'll get motivation from one of the guys doing that. But another guy's go, Hey man, you, you know, you just need to get inside and he has to handle it. The, the, the art of being a, a, if I could say a great musical director is, is having the uh, communicate communication skills, hmm. knowing how to approach each individual person. I mean, I could take the piss of, of Colin Hay, and he'll be like, oh, yeah, he would be happy. But when when John Wayne was in the band, he was fragile. And I had to talk to him and, and bring him on. And and then, uh, I mean, everybody's different. Steve Lukather, you can't be gruff enough. He's got such a, he's got the foulest mouth in the world. And you just go at him the same way. And you get great results. So I think it's, uh, my dad, uh, It's in, it comes up in the book all the time. You can be confident, but not arrogant. I don't want to hear you're telling me how great you are. We, if, you, if you're right, it'll prevail. And knowing what I know and knowing how to speak to people, which is, a, a, I, I could say with no ego, is a, a strong skill set. Uh, I communicate well. And that's pretty much, I mean, at that point, I mean, if a guy doesn't know the difference between an A7 or a half diminished chord, I'm going to be in trouble anyway. Yeah. And if you could, if you had to, I could tell guys to just play a fifth. Worry about the other guys. Worry about the inside and outside of the chord. Just play, you know, the dum 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 dum, and you get through. But there are specific inside chords. When we we had Paul Carrick when we were doing Tempted, I had to play the keyboard, the the piano part. And dude, there ain't a straight chord in that whole song. Everything is an F sharp, B over F sharp minor, F sharp minor. I'm sorry, B minor over F sharp leading to a G or everything is these intricate leading tones and nothing. It sure as hell in a one, four, five loop progression. So those songs really dictated. You have to get in the, in the way in the weeds with that stuff. So I guess my job or the job of a, of a good musical director is to know who you're dealing with and how to direct them through the, the, uh, I guess like a labyrinth in song. It's whatever, you know, some of them, are, I mean, you're playing, uh, I want to be a man. Okay. We know what that's going, but the uh, vocal parts of it don't come easy or help for my friends or any of these great Beatles songs. They got to be right. They mm -hmm. got to be right. And you've got to do your homework. Same with the baseline and uh, help for my friends. You cannot play around with that. That's a perfect classical piece of music. Right. If you miss that, any passing note, Everyone's going to know it. It's it's ingrained in our DNA. So, mm -hmm. so that's a good question. I hope I answered it correctly. Yeah, um, you were talking about um, you know sometimes getting to pick the songs as well, and uh, I'm thinking of the of the uh, Court of the Crimson King story that you just told, which was you know sort of a, a brilliant call that the guy who 
you know, whose song it was didn't think of and actually rebelled against when you first brought it up. Um, do you think that it's that um, as the music director, since you you know all this music, but you're not them, you know, so you haven't developed a particular closeness to these 20 songs, you, you know... Uh-huh what else there is. Um, does that give you a, a kind of perspective? And do you find like, were there a, other instances like the Court of the Crimson King story where you were able to bring in some songs that you wanted to do that they hadn't kind of realized were things that people would want to hear because they hadn't done it for so long? Well, there weren't many cases like that, but the point that you're making is I have the sense of objectivity. Yeah, these guys are so inside of it that they mm-hmm. lose sight of what the what the fans want. Uh, I think what I was able to do because the songs were pretty much etched by its corpus by chart positions, which is great, uh, and it, and it kind of makes it easy to tell people how to get around. That was that was one extreme incident uh, with 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 um, with um, lost track here for a second with um, Greg Lake. And, uh, you know, the other thing is the, the sets themselves are very important because they have to set a flow. And why is this guy's song? I mean, I'd always close. There'd be like what I call a power out. So the last three songs on, on the 97 tour, if I remember right, were. Do you feel like we do? Do you feel like like I do rather? Why to shade a pale and then bring those power out. And now the, the latest one is who could it be now into um to get the into uh, hold a line into bring those power out. And it's very important that uh, again people's egos they have to they have to accept these are the big songs and they're here for a reason. So but as far as finding other songs, I don't think I don't I can't recall another one. It probably there probably was one, but it's not coming to my mind right now. Uh mm-hmm. but the main thing is that people are so engrossed in what their career and what their perspective like you know like i said uh from the beginning lovely song but court of the crimson king it's like it's it was a no-brainer at least for me and again how you present it i didn't do my job that well but i said trust me because he was a big man to trust you it's like okay but it worked it could have gone horribly wrong at the same time. But it could have because gone... Court of the Crimson King, it's not like it's like, uh, you know, Her Majesty or something. It's well, like exactly. a yeah. involved piece of music. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, what, it worked out. <laughs> what about when, you know, you also mentioned the case of Dave Esmonds, Edmonds and Jack Bruce. I mean, he's had a ton of people in all these bands together. And there, there have to be times when the chemistry just, doesn't work personally and as music director uh, does that does that come down to you to settle all that or does it go to Ringo well it, it can never go to Ringo it can never get to Ringo okay that's the point so we're grown-ups and you have to you know there's one time we were on a plane and everybody's talking about how many records they sold and Ringo said something like, oh, like a half a billion he said something <laughs> off the cuff and uh no the, the thing is you have to when you're in a situation with Ringo, you have to hang your ego up. There's a coat, there's a coat hanger for your ego because you're going to be in a band with a beetle and all of your perspectives are, you, you have to temper your, your expectations and understand that the, the whole of the show is not all about you. It's about the show and I make sure. The, 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 well, the question was the, the, the raised was, does it get to Ringo? No, it cannot get to Ringo because everybody has to play nicely together, and it's my job, again, to make them get that way. But it's also my job to know how to speak to them, so it gets that way. Because you could say something wrong, and it goes to hell in a handbag in a heartbeat. Mm. Hell in a handbag in a heartbeat. That's alliteration, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it, you know, it's it's a it's a fine line that you uh that we that we that we skate on so yeah i bet hey i should pass you back to darren all right i was curious if the reverse happened in the greg lake instance where you said to greg no do the court of the crimson king and it worked out 
were you were you ever did you ever have was your mind changed for you by someone else who wanted to do a song and you felt it wasn't the right pick turned out that they were right you tried it out not that i can remember it just uh, uh i think everybody comes in knowing that what's most important is that it's the, it's again chart positions the people are going to love it uh richard page was going to do a third song it was it was um broken wings curie and i forget what the third song was like because i'm a, i'm a big mr mr fan i think i wanted to do something like um uh the healing waters or one of the other slightly obscure tunes but he had happened to have written a song called uh you are mine yeah which is just a beautiful song and Ringo usually did not allow you to do a new song or a song that no one would have heard. But we played it and Ringo got to play the cajon and he loved it. And it went over beautifully. It was one of those special moments. So Richard came in with that and I just had to say, absolutely. It was too beautiful. Uh, it was just too beautiful to not not have it in the set. So that worked at that time. But I don't remember anyone ever saying, no, we got to do this and... I don't remember being wrong any time. So that's. Uh... Was there, uh, there was a tour, and I don't remember the. They've all, all of Ringo's tours and bands have all kind of blended into one big jam session in my head. I never remember who played with who. I did it one time. All right. <laughs> um, wasn't Dave Mason supposed to be part? Ah, uh, the Dave of Mason. One of the story. tours. Yes, he was. He was supposed to be. And I don't know how much you want me to get into that, but uh, that's totally up to you. I mean, I don't know. Well, I'll just tell you this: he threw me under the bus more times than not. Uh, I would make up what we call idiot charts. In other words, I'm going to send you. I'm going to write the chords. I'm going to write the lyric, and above the word "we," there's going to be a C chord. And when it gets to the next chord, let's say the four chord, it's going to go. When it goes to the word "them," it's going to be an F chord. So I was writing, so he kind of play along and sing. And he said, oh, Mark didn't do it. And I played down a half step. I said, I did all that. And I made all the alterations. So you were reading a half step down. There was no reason. And he finally, uh, we had to do two rehearsals, two run-throughs at the last rehearsal. And he, uh, after the first one, he starts packing up his gear. And I said, Dave, so we have another room. He goes, oh, uh, didn't my manager call you? I said, your manager called me for what? I have no idea. And I'm not going to get into all of it, but he basically didn't make the last rehearsal, the last run through before we were sending the gear out. And Ringo said, uh, I'm just a drummer in the band, but I say we sack him. And there was a vote. And I won't tell you how it went at first because there's a little more than I want to divulge at this time. Sure. But the, the 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 consensus was no. It was it, we don't need somebody who didn't want to be here that much. So it was sad because his songs were great. No, yeah, was a great absolutely. songwriter. Uh, it was just it was just just sad. But the way it worked out, I mean, I think I have a T-shirt that has all the names on it, and that's like a collector's item. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you had that one instance with Dave Mason, it's remarkable because there have been so many musicians and so many tours that you've had like maybe one issue, possibly maybe um, one and a half. But everything right. ultimately all has all come together. And from our perspective as fans, I mean, when you do get like a, a band that has a Richard Page or a Howard Jones and a Sheila E along with Greg Lake and Roger Hodgson, and you think, wow, that's that's a crazy combination. And then when it's the show's over, you're like, that was great. <laughs> I mean, they really, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, I'm trying yeah. to think of another example. I think when, like when Richard Marks, and then you'd have Billy Squire. I mean, the right. era is similar, but the styles of music were a little different. You get seamless. And Again. sometimes I came out fans of of musicians that. Going in, I sort of didn't pay close attention to. Came out the other end, and I'm like, you know what? I got to check this guy's you, or, or this guy's stuff out now because I'm. You, I'm come, oh. you come out as a fan because you see what what the what their music did, and you see how it was interpreted, and uh, that's a that's a great point. 
uh, Darren, it's uh, um, there were times that I heard the, the list of people. I'm like, whoa, how am I going to pull? It's like it's like the first thing I think is like herding cats because I didn't know <laughs> enough about how one person's musical ability or how they were going to perform the particular songs. Again, uh, when we had um, Eric Carmen was in the band. When it came to some boogie woogie, uh, was it Dave Edmonds? Who, when Dave Edmonds played, uh, I forget what song it was. Jack Bruce went over and played piano, so we had that rolling piano thing. And I think uh, Eric played bass, and he played very straight ahead. But I had to make lemonade out of lemons because I didn't think it was going to work, and it went, and somehow we got it together. It was it. There are challenges. But the challenges, uh, what's the, there's a book I read or I listened to called The Obstacle is the Way. When you have an obstacle, sometimes it just makes it, it makes you stronger and you wind up finding something about your ability that you had no idea that you had prior to the obstacle. So I want to ask one quick question. I know the your answer is something that's probably in Ken's, this question probably somewhere in Ken's head. Um, you talked about, uh, suggesting what songs should be performed by each of the uh, artists, but does that has that ever happened with Ringo? Uh, because so many times fans who go to every tour are hoping maybe Ringo will pull one Beatles song out of their hat that he hasn't been performing or solo hit because uh, right. he doesn't hit all his hits. No pun intended. Right. Or right, when it right. comes to new music, he won't necessarily plug his new album he'll do it sometimes and not other right. times. do you have his ear when it comes to his songs and what he's uh, i've been trying to get him to do a beatles song uh any beatles song from you know just uh just i mean his drumming is so unbelievably identifiable and so so much him that I've been trying to get him to do a Beatles song like we'd have five Beatles songs and every night we just pick one out and do something but he said no I'm not going to do that I said why not I said Paul's doing this and this one does that and um I mean we got him to do Octopus's Garden after like uh, Luke got him to do that he just hounded him so much uh he's tough that way he doesn't want to do certain things i've tried to i mean there was one time when we did um um uh what was the song now oh my my and he said, oh, i hate that song. i'm not gonna do it and i was telling him well i said because it's a great song it's a great feel yeah, yeah. and i got him to do it and i was we had an argument about the lyric i said no can you boogie? Can you slug it? I didn't sing that. I said, yes, you did. It's, it was, and it turned out I was right. I mean, I'll tell you one story that's in the book that uh, we were playing um, Don't Pass Me By and he hadn't played piano for like six months, whatever. And he went over and it's in a different key. You know, he, we transposed the, the keyboard, but his hands were in the wrong place. And he started banging it. And myself, Steve Luke, at the Todd Rundgren, Richard Page, and Greg Bissonette heard it was so wrong. And he's playing. And I saw what the problem was. And he starts cursing at me. And I won't get into what he said, but he's, oh, you messed up. Oh, fuck. Oh, you, you ruined my thing. And he's yelling at me. And I know he's wrong. And finally, I just grabbed his hand and put it in the right place. And he played it perfectly. And he went through it like he struts down and then sings a song, goes on the drums, and it's over. Like everybody thinks that's over. And he got to a drum kit. He goes, Mark Rivera. He goes, I'm so sorry. And I was like, whoa. Because everyone knew it was like the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. And so sometimes you get to ask him. Sometimes you say, hey, can you can we try this? And for as long as I've done this gig, I've been wanting him to do anything from – one of the great Beatles songs. I mean, they, they, I don't want to get into which particular song, but even I should have known better or Ticket to Ride. 
tack it, tack yeah. tack it, tack it. His classic drum fills, the drum feels that just changed everything the way we think. Uh, it's not a rumba anymore. It's a beetle. It's a because rumba is boom, 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 and and he just turned it into this rock thing, but he just won't do it. And I think at one time I asked him, I said, well, Paul does this. And um, someone asked him, why do you think Paul? Oh, Paul, he asked Paul, you know, you're doing a George record and you're doing a soft John record. How come you don't do any of mine? Paul said, because you're not dead. So, <laughs> so there's, there's that to contend with. But anyway, uh, I don't get I don't get my way all the time, obviously. So. You know what? I'd, I'd be interested in hearing. I, I I really doubt he would do it publicly, but if you could persuade him to do it in a rehearsal and like, you know, send me the tape, I can trade it to you for uh, Jimi Hendrix at Madison Square Garden, May 18th, 69. Um, <laughs> um, when he was in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, right. his, his big break used to be a thing called Star Time. And I'd love to hear what Star Time was. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I had to. I had to dig into that. So, but uh, I'll tell you one thing that I did get to do. Uh, I got him. I got well. Luke started playing. I got him to play the, the feel of "Tomorrow Never Knows," which is one of my favorite songs of all time. Yeah. And there's all this talk that it's a loop and this and that, and he just went. It's the it's the record, and the, it's spot on, dead on. And everybody plays it. No, it's not that. It's and it's that. It's it's the way. It's where he puts that. Yeah. A thousand drummers could play the same thing. I mean, I remember Dave Grohl talking about it when uh, Ringo's photograph album came out. Uh, the book came out, and Dave Grohl said, "You could have a, a thousand drummers play a Beatles song, and not one of them." will play exactly what Ringo played because he swings a certain way and there's a certain sway to his drumming that no one will ever have. And and anything he does has that to it. Um, it's just like, a, it's almost like the uh, the formula for Coca-Cola, only he's got it. So <laughs> they ain't giving it up. <laughs> so How much more time? You were close to out of time for you. Well, right? I actually was supposed to be someplace a minute ago. Uh -oh. But... Um, is there any chance of doing this again or getting a, another run at this, or is this going to go out and this is the last chance I get? No, no. I mean, I, do it again. I'd love to, I'd love to answer those five, my favorite, okay. Ringo Soda and all of that, but we could, if you want to do it another time, I would be more than happy. What are you doing Monday? You want to do a part two? Next I would love that. Cause I'd really rather spend more time than to, than to not give you the, the what you deserve. I mean, it's Ringo and I love him. And I, I feel remiss if I didn't say, "Hey, this and this, there's yeah. too much that we haven't we haven't even gotten into." Right. And if we could do it again, I'd, I'd be greatly, I'd be appreciative. If you're available, because, like, yeah. that would be fabulous. Yeah. All right. All right, you guys don't mind. Mind. I'm We're thrilled. Okay. okay. You're okay, breaking great. my arm, Mark. Oh, you kill me <laughs> over. All right. Um, we have so much more to get to. I have. A couple more pages of questions. I know I saw <laughs> a notebook full of them. And Alan, uh, so would you come back, Mark? Would you oh, I'm, way too, I'm way too busy. I'm way too busy for this. <laughs> I would absolutely love to. I would be. Uh, it would be a thrill because there's so much stuff in here we have to get to, and I'd be. Yeah. I'd, I'd be. I'd feel terrible if I didn't get to say more things. That uh, uh, uh it's it's an honor to to speak oh, about my friend. Thank you. And so we'll do that, folks. So we're going to have a Mark Rivera part two. Uh, part two. Part two. Peace so of love. <laughs> there's more to come. And Mark, thank you for your time today. And, thank you. Um, and happy trails. We'll see you uh, thank you. next show. God, God willing. Darren, Ken, Alan. What was that? You're on my shirt here, you know. That's why. Oh, I there I am. Here. There I am right there. <laughs> I love it. Got Greg love it. Ed here, Todd Rungman there. Todd, yeah, that was a great tour. So I, thank you. I got the Brooklyn you. Nets on for Brooklyn. Brooklyn. There Jackson. you go. Brooklyn. Darren, All Ken, right. Alan, thank you so much for your time and your understanding. Thank you. Great. Peace and love. I'll see, I'll, see you, I'll see you Monday. Yep. All right. Out of sight. Be well. Take care. Thank you. All right. So that is outstanding. We're going to have Mark Rivera back for a second show. 
talk more about Ringo, talk more about the All Star Band. Uh, maybe we'll pick his brain a little bit with uh, some some Billy more Billy Joel stuff as well. And uh, so we have another show with Mark Rivera coming up next time. So uh, hit the pause button, click, and um, pick up with Mark Rivera on the next show. In the meantime, um, Ken and Alan, let's uh, check in with you and get your information, what you've been up to, contact information, and all things uh, going on in your worlds. Ken? Okay, first of all, um, after a three-week vacation, um, I'm back in business, sort of, with my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, more Beatles trivia. There's one page for that. And as usual, 10 prizes to pick from. And uh, the trivia question, by the way, has to do with double-sided hits by the Beatles. Wow. Okay. Cool. That's it. KenMichaelsRadio.com. Uh, there will be some new shows coming on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. More with Luca Parasi, who wrote this fine book. Paul McCartney, Music is Ideas. It's information about all the music that Paul released from the beginning of his solo career through the end of the 80s. We're going to be talking about the George Martin trilogy, Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, and Give My Regards to Broad Street, and The End of Wings. That's going to be in my next show there. Um, on the other talk show podcast, for which I'm a co-host, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, we had the other Mark as a special guest on the show that being Mark Hudson. And we celebrated the 20th anniversary of Ringo Rama. And Mark talked about his time producing, songwriting with Ringo on that album and, and in general, the other albums too that he worked on with Ringo and his love for the Beatles and his other encounters with the Beatles. So you can pick that up on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a, so a solo Beatles video cast. It's also on all audio platforms. And then there's also my radio show, Every Little Thing, which is heard on around 50 radio stations. Check out my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, for a listing of all the radio stations, when they air it, um, and links to their websites. Okay? So all that's going on right now for me. Now, okay. Alan Stern. Okay. Well, I've mostly been um, working on the book. Um, <laughs> sort of all I do because we have a deadline coming up and uh, I'm now sort of uh, living in the world of 1976 uh, Wings Over America we had already actually I had already written the chapter after it so I've done the European stuff after Wings Over America and then backtracked to Wings Over America and now I'll have to read them both to see if it still makes sense in the order because I don't I don't like writing out of order but um, for various reasons had to do it the very funny thing is you know we, we quote a lot of reviews and interviews and uh, at this point I basically know, know all of the people who are, have been reviewing him and interviewing him. You know, these are these are people who I who I got to personally know over the years. And I was thinking that you know, May seventy six is right when I graduated from school and was desperately trying to get to work with these people who I'm now quoting for the book, you know, and got to be friends with over the years in between the many years in between. And uh, so it's kind of a, a fun thing to, uh, you know, find myself in the middle of. Um, and yeah, so anyway, but if you want to get in touch with me, um, I have two Facebook pages, Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. And um, you can write to all of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We try to answer. Um, sometimes it doesn't require an answer. Sometimes we try to answer anyway. Sometimes uh, you guys give us really good ideas for shows, which we discuss and take up and, uh, and, you know, you may see. So if you have ideas, feel free to let us know and uh, we'll see what we can do. So I think that's it for me. And we will see them there. Yeah. Um, and as for me, I got a couple of quick things. I'll keep them brief. The main part of uh, what I do at WFUV, I'm on the air five days a week, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. until 2 a.m., and then Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. 
except on Saturday the 22nd, I will not be on the air from 1 to 4, my normal time. I'll have the honor of filling in for Don McGee on Mixed Bag. Uh, so that'll be from 4 until 8 p.m. Uh, and that is on the 22nd of July, that's Saturday. And that's always a lot of fun because get to <laughs> what little I have, I get to let my hair down and kind of go all kinds of different places musically. Uh, then on Tuesday, July 25th, anyone listening in the New York City metro area, especially Westchester County, Rockland County, Orange County, uh, Connecticut, um, I will be hosting uh, an evening at uh, Jacob Burns Film Center in Pleasantville, uh, part of their uh, series, I believe it's called Sounds of Summer, uh, where they have music-oriented films in the summertime. On Tuesday the 25th, I'll be the host for the King Crimson documentary in the court of the Crimson King, King Crimson at 50, and uh, they'll show the film. And uh, as far as I know, I'll talk about the band and the film leading into it. And that's on Tuesday, July 25th at 7 p.m. at uh, the Jacob Burns Film Center in Pleasantville. Uh, so you got the dates of the regular show, the Phil mix bag, King Crimson, and look for me on Facebook. Two pages. You can't miss. I mean, look at the size of me. You can't miss me. So <laughs> come look for me on Facebook. And and I'm really jazzed up now because we're going to have another show with Mark Rivera coming up. So hopefully you'll join us for that. So for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, uh, I'm Darren DeVivo. This is Things We Said Today. Peace and love. Thanks so much for watching. And we'll see you in a matter of days.